So this talk, as I was looking over the slides um, last night, does have more technical botanical terms in it than previous talks. So just relax, hear them. I think they'll make sense. And if they don't stick this time, if you read articles or books, listen to podcasts or webinars, they're going to make a little more sense in the future. So um, a little bit of an apology, um, but all for the enthusiasm of creating fabulous edibles in your garden, like these raspberries. Once you grow your own raspberries, uh, I don't think you'll ever, ever buy them from the store again. And, uh, and your, your vegetables you're not going to get tomatoes in the winter like you have summer tomatoes from your garden. So it's all for a good cause. So we do have multiple pollinators. We've got bees, largely bees, butterflies and moths. Um, even wasps can pollinate, um, although they're not my favorite animal. There are some flowers that are so tiny with tiny entrances that it's only a gnat that can get around the the curvatures and get to pollinate. Um, beetles, evidently we're all learning how to say lady beetle instead of ladybug um, because they're technically beetles. Birds, bats, and even mice. Evidently the proteus flowers from South Africa, they're on very, very thick stems and mammals crawl up the stems and pollinate them. So I wasn't familiar with, uh, with mice and furry animals pollinating except for bats, but they evidently do pollinate. So when you think of being a, a home gardener that's growing edibles, um, you are channeling your inner farmer and hopefully you can extend your edible collection to vegetables, fruit, um, maybe try some wine grapes, some olives or olive oil, because even if you have just one or two trees, you can join something called a community press and um, that's when everybody contributes olives and gets um, olive oil. But you also need to channel your inner rancher, even if you're a vegan, um, because most flowers require an animal to do that heavy lifting of moving the pollen, i.e. pollinating. So the main pollinators are bees. And most people have the image of the yellow and black European honeybee that was introduced to produce honey. Um, but there turns out to be 1600 different species of bees native to California. And they don't, some of them don't look like honeybees at all. In fact, you wouldn't even think they were a bee unless you were an entomologist or had it in a field guide and saw the picture like this metallic shiny green thing rather than being fuzzy yellow and black. So um, certain bees are actually better pollinators than European honeybees. Um, of course, that might be just Californian um, preference, but it is actually true. Some uh, bees have specific relationships with uh, the flowers that they pollinate, but most are very general. So if the flower is open and it has pollen and nectar, a flying insect is going to pollinate it. Of the native bees that are so important, 70% are ground nesting and 30% are cavity nesting. And they are basically solitary bees. So they're not very defensive or prone to attack you because they're not protecting a huge hive with millions of brothers and sisters. Um, they're solitary bees and they're very, very busy getting the pollen for the next generation. So to carry the pollen back, and you can see the pollen granules on this little guy. Um, they've got um, pouches and branched hairs to, um, to carry their pollen back to their nest. So why bother raising your own bees? Um, basically by providing habitat for the bees to live uh, rather than just use the European honeybees. European honeybees travel really, really far. Generally, they can forage around two mile circle They've been clocked at traveling up to four miles. However, the calories they bring home after that eight mile round trip is actually equal to the calories that they burn making the trip. So they choose not to do that. But our native bees are gonna stay closer to home and have a range of just 400 to 1000 feet. And so you need to provide habitat nearby in order to get your garden pollinated. 
these native bees co-evolved with local native plants over millions of years and are going to thrive in their midst. So they're not necessarily going to nest in your garden, and I'll explain why, but nearby. And so have your edible garden and have um, habitat for your native insects right around it. So they have a very interesting life cycle that I was actually not aware of until I read about it. But the ground nesting bees are going to choose a patch of actual bare soil, not with four inches of mulch on it or two inches of compost on it, but just bare soil, preferably not terribly compacted. So you don't want to walk on it and you don't want to have any weeds on it, which is very funny because how do you not have weeds unless you walk on it? So I figure we need to invent a weeding drone, um, but no mulch or compost. I mean, there can be scattered twigs and, and light duff, which is the natural fall of, of plants, um, but no heavy soil disturbance. So your vegetable bed that you're constantly weeding and transferring plants and stuff like that are not gonna be a habitat for the ground nesting native bees. So um, when they do emerge and start um, gathering pollen and drinking nectar, um, they're gonna really thrive on native plants and then roll over to your edible garden. And um, because there's 12 months in a year, you want something flowering all year long. So um, generally you want a beautiful pollinator garden that you're gonna hear about on June 25th. Um, around your edibles that are gonna be more of a one-shot deal. They're gonna flower one period of a time, not over a prolonged period of time. Um, and then you want nesting area that has hollow twigs, that's for the cavity um, nesting bees and um, undisturbed ground for your ground nesting bees. So those parts of your garden may look a little au naturel, which is good. So their life cycle is unbelievable. So a female bee um, gets fertilized. So she has fertilized eggs. She will dig a hole 20 inches down into the earth, which I find digging a hole six inches of ground into the earth challenging sometimes. So 20 inches down with a little side passage, she will gather pollen and stick it together with nectar and make a pollen loaf, put a single egg on it, and then gather more pollen, make another side passage, a different side passage, side passage, have a pollen loaf, single egg, dot, 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 around 20 eggs. The cavity nesting bees are gonna find a hollow twig. They're not gonna bore into it and make a pollen loaf. These are actually the larvae that are already hatched. Make a pollen loaf and then put in a room divider because we all like our separate bedrooms and then another pollen loaf, another egg room divider, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And um, when they make these room dividers, a lot of the bees will cut perfectly circular holes in leaves, which actually doesn't damage the plant at all. And they're quite pretty to, uh, to see in the garden with the light shining through them. So if you see perfectly circular holes in the middle of a leaf, you might suspect that it is a cavity dwelling bee rather than a caterpillar, which generally um, eats from the edge. So this egg will hatch, the larvae will form, it will go through its instars, which is its growth phases, and then do the metamorphosis, just like a caterpillar to a butterfly, and then emerge as a flying adult. So it'll be underground for 11 months and flying around for one month and has a lifespan of one year. So you can see why it would be practical to have 1,600 species of native bees, because there's going to be some emerging in January, February, March, throughout the year in different niches and eating different plants. So it's a huge population of species, which are just amazing. A lot of work um, in their parenthood. So to feed a bee around your edible garden, add a hedgerow. So there are um, plants that are considered keystone species for the insect population. Um, you've got your manzanitas, the genus is called Arctostaphylus, and your, my favorite plant, coyote bush, um, the Latin name is Bacchus pilularis, and then our California lilac, Ceanothus, beautiful uh, redbuds, 
and smaller um, flowering plants um, like the Eriogonum. Um, that's Toyon Oaks. This is a native plum that's actually an evergreen with shiny leaves. It's really, really pretty. And many salvias. And actually, if you do have a little waterway, our native willows are great support plants for insects. If you squish all your plants together, um, you don't have a lot of open space for the ground nesting bees. So spread them out a little bit. Um, grasses, ironically, are good for pollinators. Well, grasses are wind pollinated. They don't actually have nectar. They don't have butterflies landing on them, but they are considered, many of them are considered host plants, meaning they're gonna support the caterpillars eating the leaves um, before they turn into the flying insects that you think of as, as pollinators. Um, our lawns are getting less popular. Um, here would be the roots of a typical turf grass, um, just a few inches deep requiring lots and lots of water that we're being short of in California. And this um, diagram is actually from the plains. So it includes, includes grasses and flowering plants of the Great Plains, but it shows how deep the native plant roots can go, um, clocking down to 20 feet deep. Our uh, water table was at 12 feet. So if my native grasses finally get to maturity, um, they actually will not need any supplemental irrigation. And trees generally, once established, do not need supplemental irrigation. Lots of species of native uh, bunch grasses, <coughs> excuse me, and they're really practical for areas in the garden where people tend to cut corners. If you have a lovely woody plant and you cut a corner, you're gonna break a branch but these grasses you can pretty much abuse and um, they're great for those short circuit areas. Um, so what are we pollinating? We're pollinating flowers or we're not, we're inviting insects to pollinate flowers. And I have a hard time picking a flower because it's just a phase on the way to a seed, which is the next generation of plant and oftentimes the fruit around it, like an apple, protecting the seed and inviting an animal to eat it and walk far, far away and deposit it with a package of fertilizer known as manure. Um, and that's called seed dispersal. So flowers are the sexual reproductive organ of the plant and they provide the genetic diversity, just like you have a mother and a father. And um, half the genes from one parent and half the genes from the other parent mix up the genes like um, mixing up a deck of cards. So flowers, 90% uh, of species are insect pollinated. So they need to entice the insects to come and carry the pollen from the anther to the pistil, stigma style ovary, that long distance, no, just kidding. Um, and assure cross-pollination for genetic diversity. So um, they do it by pretty colors, pretty smells. And what's so, so interesting is that they evolved, started evolving 180 million years ago with the diversity of flowers and then the diversity of insects. And it just so happens that we, that came much later, find what insects find is beautiful, similarly beautiful. Kind of fun. So we have uh, bee aesthetics. So some flowers are perfect, meaning um, they have pollen and they have the ova that will become the seed in the carpel that will become the fruit. And they have both parts. They can self-pollinate or pollinate between them. So this pear tree, which got a little exuberant with its flowers this spring, um, are gonna cross pollinate with other flowers, but each flower has both parts, has stamen and pistil. But there, and um, the diversity of flowers is just unbelievable. These are not edible plants, but these are just wild, wild images of what flowers can look like. Um, Cause in 180 years, you can get a lot of divergence. So um, actually that says 125 million years. I'm gonna have to backdate that. 
So it's interesting that the nectar can actually be customized or is customized for who is pollinating. So it's going to be thinner for bees because they're smaller and have, um, you know, slurp up um, thinner fluid. Hummingbirds have higher metabolic requirements. So that has a little more calories and it's a little thicker. And bats being warm blooded mammals um, have the highest caloric, highest sugar um, type of nectar. The flowers can also engineer to protect evaporation of the nectar. And um, so your arctostaphylus are gonna be downward facing because they flower in February and don't wanna get washed out. Um, and um, protect both the pollen and the nectar with really interesting designs. So the flowers, um, say of the Fabaceae, so your peas and your beans and your lupins are really gonna protect their pollen. They've got the banner, wings and keel. So when a bee lands on it and you can put your finger on a keel and push down gently, the stamens will pop up and rub on the bee's belly and deposit the pollen. So when they go to the next flower, they can pollinate the next flower. So the pollen is completely invisible. You cannot see it um, without a bee on it and um, protected, but the, the bee knows to trip the, uh, trip the keel and, um, and get their prize, get their pollen and nectar. The most protected pollen are tomato plants and cousins of tomatoes, peppers, which is Dan's favorites, and uh, eggplants, and curiously, blueberries and cranberries and huckleberries. These flowers require buzz pollination or sonication. So, and that's 9% of species of flowers that cannot be pollinated by European honeybees. So imagine a salt shaker. And the holes of the salt shaker are just a little bit too small. So if you hold the salt shaker still upside down, no salt is falling out. But if you shake it vigorously, you're gonna get the salt out on your french fries or whatever bad thing you're gonna be eating. So there are tiny holes or slits, but you need a vibration to release them. So the bumblebees hold on to the flower and they hold their wings still, but they vibrate their body instead and shake it at an extraordinarily high frequency and get gobs and gobs of pollen. So tomatoes require this also, and they can self-pollinate, but you get a much higher yield if you have bumblebees pollinating. So commercial tomato growers will actually have habitat for the very small colonies. So bumblebees are colony forming. They're not completely solitary, but small colonies of bumblebees in their protected greenhouses or whatever for their, um, for their tomato pollination. And the bumblebees are so um, fastidious in their pollination that they can document 100% coverage. Every single flower gets visited. So um, buzz pollination or sonication. There's like no nectar, um, but you can see that it's hanging down and that pollen is falling right on the tummy of the, of the bumblebee. So there are imperfect flowers. If there's perfect flowers, there's gonna be imperfect flowers. So they only have a stamen or they only have a pistil, but they don't have both. And what confused me was how I could go to the farmer's market in the summer and see baskets of beautiful squash blossoms, but then go back to the farmer's market in October and see the squash. So if you picked all the blossoms, how do you have squashes develop later? Well, it turns out the flowers are unisexual and you can pick the pollen producing flowers, most, but not all. And there's enough remaining so that bees can pollinate the rest of the flowers. So here is a developing squash. So that would be a female flower. So you wouldn't pick this flower for your um, stuffed squash blossoms with ricotta and herbs and all sorts of delicious stuff. Um, but you, would wait until the fall and harvest a squash. So why have an imperfect flower? Is that a bad thing? Well, it guarantees cross-pollination between flowers. It doesn't guarantee cross-pollination between plants, but it does guarantee cross-pollination between flowers. So 
everyone loves butterflies because they are stunning and they have a completely different parenting model than the native bees. So here where the bee would dig underground and collect pollen and uh, make a pollen loaf for their larvae, um, the butterfly is going to um, determine a host plant that is appropriate for their caterpillar next generation. And they actually have chemoreceptors on their feet. So we have chemoreceptors on our tongue. If we close our eyes, we can tell an apricot from a peach. Um, and she can tell a milkweed and Asclepias from any other plant by pawing it basically with her feet. And if she determines that it is a milkweed, she will glue on an egg. The egg has a little spot of glue on it. So it's right there on the leaf and the caterpillar will, the egg will hatch and the larvae, the caterpillar will eat, be right on dinner and breakfast and lunch. So we actually want lots and lots and lots of caterpillars in our gardens, which is a little counterintuitive because you don't want your garden um, defoliated, but that actually won't happen because birds love caterpillars. Um, so when you have a natural balance in your garden, you're feeding the birds and you are raising up the next generation of moths and butterflies. So there are host plants which are considered keystone species. And that means they, report, uh, they support many, many different insect species. And it also means that if that keystone species were eliminated from that environment, then ooh, there's a lot of fallout damage. So the most keystone-y of the keystone species is the oak. So this is a Quercus agrifolia, the great punt oak tree. Wait another couple hundred years and it'll be even greater. But it is estimated there's what, 1500 different species that depend on the oak. But there's little guys too. Um, there's the native prunus, the prunus alicifolia, which is a beautiful small tree and lots of little flowering plants. Um, wild buckwheat and salvias and even the grasses that can be host plants, meaning munched on by caterpillars. Um, what's interesting is if you do have a host plant and you're allowing habitat for caterpillars to be raised, you really don't want anything under the tree. Don't want lawn, don't want to mow it, don't want to walk under it. I mean, yes, you can have one shade tree, but this would be left under uh, on its own. And that's because when the caterpillar pupates and it's likely to drop to the ground, so it's not like a sitting duck for birds. And that is gonna be habitat for the pupation period before it emerges as a butterfly. So you want some areas of the garden that are off limits to people and um, basically a nursery. Um, buckwheats are great habitat plants, beautiful clusters of flowers, different sizes, different colors. And um, they are, um, the diversity is just amazing. So there's an, a um, website called calscape.org, which um, is help for picking plants for the garden in California of native plants. And they list 261 species of eriogonums. And um, I have, I don't know, three or four in my garden, but not 261. Has a long flowering season and they're great landscape plants around your edible garden. So there are plants that are the opposite of a keystone species. They're completely one-on-one -on -one relationship between one insect and one plant. And that would be the beautiful Dutchman's pipe vine with these strange purpley brown flowers that appear in February that are actually gnat pollinated. That would be an example where a little tiny gnat would fly in and fly out. But the leaves, um, it's deciduous when they leaf out. The leaf is the obligate food, meaning the only food of the pipe vine swallowtail butterfly. So if you have a place for a vine and you like swallowtails, um, and who doesn't um, consider the uh, Dutchman's pipe vine. So caterpillars eat leaves, bees and butterflies enjoy the flowers. Birds are going to eat the insects, but they're also going to eat seeds primarily because it has way higher calories per bite. So you can go on a diet eating lettuce, 
you cannot go on a bite diet munching peanut butter. So many calories per bite increased. So I don't actually deadhead um, because a flower is just a phase on its way to an insect and um, on its way to having um, uh, fruit and mature seeds. So some seed collection is allowed. So this is a very high-tech, patented high-tech seed head agitator and containment unit. So when people do restoration gardening, meaning finding native plants and propagating those from a specific locale, they generally collect, uh, try to collect 10% of the visible seeds on a particular plant. And then 90% of the seeds do what they were gonna do anyway, um, either reproduce that plant or feed the insects around it. Um, and that leads to the surprising statistic of million to one odds. So there are a lot of plants that produce a million seeds when technically it only needs one seed to reproduce itself once. So would you consider that a bad design or profligate or wasteful? But in my mind, it's just an example of what plants do. Plants make food for everybody. They take sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and make glucose and they build that up to all the other molecules that that is in the plant and you can eat the leaves you can eat the stems you can eat the roots and you can eat the actual flowers or the seeds or the fruit so it just depends on what phase of the plant that you're eating but basically it's going to make a lot more than it needs to reproduce itself once um, just because they share and they are the food producers for every animal for every fungus for most bacteria on the entire planet. So we have to give a nod to the plants. We like to have birds in the garden too. And hummingbirds would be the pollinator that you first think of. And the statistics of hummingbirds just, just blow me away. I mean, they're, they weigh a penny. Um, their heart rate is 1200 times a minute. Um, ours is what, 60 to 80 and may go up to 170. Uh, if you're running a, you know, 10 second, uh, 100 yard, 100 meter dash, their wings beat at 70 times a second, and they eat several times their body weight in nectar daily. So, and they supplement that sugary solution with um, small insects too. So flowering red tubular plants in the garden are gonna entice your hummingbirds. Uh, one plant for the late season would be the Epilobium canum, California fuchsia, I've had really good luck with it. September, October, November, lots and lots of red tubular flowers and lots of hummingbirds enjoying them. Birds provide other um, services in the garden, especially for even big scale farmers. And the most important bird I have in my garden is the Western bluebird because it's an insect eater. It keeps down the, the nuisance insects. Um, they like to sit on a fence and drop down to, um, to catch their prey rather than a swallow uh, catching insects on the wing. And they are cavity nesters. So since we don't have a lot of dead, very, very old trees with lots of holes in them, um, meaning cavities for cavity nesting birds, um, and there's a number of them, uh, you can look up how to make the greatest, the simplest, the most straightforward um, nesting box at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. So that's a good present to give someone when they're moving into a new house as a couple of birdhouses. Um, a lot of plants have perfect seed capsules for birds. Um, they don't just drop on the ground and get um, invisible quickly. And one of my favorite plants is you'll see in road ditches. I mean, it's just amazing. This huge five foot tall plant with big yellow flowers um, called Hooker's Evening Prim Primrose. Hooker is named after a person, um, not after the job. Um, but their seed capsules actually, these are immature. When they get mature, they open at the top and they stay upright. And they're like little bird feeders without you uh, filling up a bird fever. The other insect in your garden you may see or you may see evidence of are called parasitoids. Not a parasite, but a parasitoid. And what they can do, generally a lot of them are little tiny non-stinging wasps, but they will find an egg or a larvae 
and put their ovipositor on it and deposit an egg. So their larvae eats, eats out the insect. So they are really good at insect control. And um, you can actually, there's an industry of buying parasitoids for say fly control and stuff like that for dairies and um, uh, horse uh, equine um, property. Um, and actually the coyote bush supports the parasitoids. But another whole, whole branch of insects in your garden, they're not directly pollinating, but maybe providing some balance to, to the insect population. Um, here's a great fall flowering plant, the coyote bush. Um, it is dioecious, two houses, has the male and female flowers on different plants. Um, that supports a lot of pollen and nectar insects in the late fall and grows. Here's all the dead plants around it and it's still green. Grows with in areas documented to be growing in areas with three inches annual average rainfall a year. So certainly the rainfall that we're getting would be more than enough in most areas. So there are plants in your edible garden that do not require a pollinator. They are wind pollinated. And the one fun one to think about is corn. So you have the tassels on the top and it will rain down pollen onto the end of each and every silk, which will send down that pollen all the way down to one and only one kernel. So each silk is attached to one kernel each. And each kernel is gonna be, have an embryonic plant for the next generation. So if you, I mean, I know we have seedless watermelon now. I don't think we're ever going to have silkless corn because that's how the whole kernel develops to get the pollen down to the, down to the kernel. Um, if you're growing corn uh, and you have different uh, varieties, um, they will cross pollinate. So there's the hard corn that you feed to animals and the soft corn, that, the sweet corn that we eat, they have to be planted you know, half a mile apart, so you don't end up breaking your teeth eating the, the uh, soft corn. Wind pollinated plants have flowers. We don't often think of them intellectually as flowers because we think most people think of flowers as having pretty petals. So they don't bother making petals because they're wind pollinated. They don't have to have a eat here sign uh, for the passing bee, but they do have to have a lot of material, sophisticated uh, structural designs to, um, to be able to withstand strong winds since that's where they generally grow. Um, so the anthers need to flutter in the wind, but not obviously break off. But if you look at grasses in our cereal grains, I don't know how many people are growing wheat in their home garden or maybe some ancient grains like farro, um, but they're gonna be wind pollinated without petals, but with flowers. So in conclusion, the edible garden that you have will benefit from having a diverse ecosystem around it. So my recommendation is to complement the edibles with native plants to support native insects and birds, and they will happily transfer over from the native part of your garden to your edible patch with luscious rewards. So I'll open for questions. Fabulous, <laughs> <laughs> Joan, thank you very much. Um, we don't have a lot of questions from people, although I will keep my eye out here in case uh, somebody didn't have time to hammer one out. But I, I do have a, a question from people who live in the cold foggy belt, San Francisco or along the coast. Uh, any recommendations for flowers that are particularly good for them to try to grow to support their pollinators? So um, seaside daisy, that's kind of a hint, seaside, erigeron glaucus, gorgeous sort of periwinkle, light purple flowers with yellow centers. Um, you can probably see it on Sunset Boulevard. Um, down on ocean beach and stuff like that. I mean, really will take the fog and enjoy that. And Armeria meridima, um, sea thrift. Um, I mean, it grows on bluffs with that vicious wind kind of 
um, coasting over it and the fog and stuff like that. So a lot of the plants that have the word C in it are going to be really enjoy that habitat and really thrive and just not be happy at all uh, further inland. Um, yeah, and uh, things like Armeria and the seaside daisies are readily available uh, as starter plants at, at some time during the year, maybe not all the time, um, but you can keep your eyes open for those. Uh, also, uh, limonium uh, might be available, uh, sea lavender. Uh, oh, yeah. And in my experience, almost, almost anything in the daisy family can tolerate uh, the foggy climbs. And uh, if you have a nice open flower where you can see the pollen basically in the middle, uh, that's gonna be attractive to pollinators. Um, some of the plants have been so uh, engineered over the years to make huge showy flowers that they've covered up most of the pollen making uh, parts of the plant, and they're not quite as friendly to the pollinators. So it, I'm not against showy flowers, um, but make sure that you have some that are sort of open and happy looking uh, and showing all their parts to the to the insects. Right. It's like the rose, the native rose, the Rosa gymnocarpa and the Rosa californicum, five petals, you, many stamens that you can see, you can put your finger on it and gather the pollen yourself. And they're very innocent looking flowers. And then the more robust multi-petaled flowers that you can't even see the center of. So it's our aesthetics wanna move back to, I think more original plants instead of engineered plants. Uh, good question here. Uh, I, I just planted a lot of natives. Should I trim them when they die back uh, to keep them looking good? Any rules on trimming? So the, the California fuchsia, the um, Epilobium canum, really benefits from a trim back in January because the new growth is going to be on the end of the old growth and it's not going to be supported. It's going to flop over. But that's all the flowers have completely seeded and the seeds have flown away and and so the flower has gone through all its stages of its life. So that one really um, enjoys trimming back the California fuchsia. Um, most of the trees don't need aggressive pruning. Um, their natural habitat is gonna be um, pretty healthy. Um, so it doesn't need a lot of artistic pruning like say a Japanese maple or something like that. Um, other small, the salvias, I, I don't, prune back those. Do you, do you, Dan? Uh, I, I do trim salvias back every few years okay. uh, because they tend to get woody and, and tall. And uh, I, I try to do it in kind of a cycle. So I'm not doing mowing them all down to the ground at once. Um, but uh, I, I think they benefit from that and they branch out then and, and I sort of tip them as they grow a little bit in the spring so that they're a little bushier. Yeah, there's a lot of good salvias and you can really have a range of size. I mean, some that are under two feet, some that are four feet, you know, so depending on how much room in your garden. Um, yeah, they haven't gotten too leggy in my garden, so but I'm sure I'll be printing them back. <laughs> Uh, let's see, questions about where we can acquire native plants. Uh, there are lots of, uh, lots, most nurseries will, garden centers will have some native plants. There are also nurseries that are dedicated to native plants. And uh, you should get to know the ones in your area. Um, there's one here in Mill Valley. There's one in Fairfax. Uh, and there are lots of them, uh, th several over in the East Bay. Uh, so uh, use the internet and find your local native plant store and, and be friendly with it. Um, there's also one in San Francisco. Uh, so the last talk I gave actually had sort of a list of the hidden charms or the secret powers of um, about 10 native plants that were generally available at the Slow Garden Center. So it has more detailed information about um, the plants so you can see if one of them is going to feel, fill a niche in your niche in your garden. Um, so yeah, there's 
there's a starting point and slope too. And that's yeah. tailored to the location of the garden center. It, it, it makes sense to use the list of keystone species um, so that you are working from the top, uh, planting the plants that will be most beneficial to the largest number of critters, uh, you know, to start with and then work your way down. And there are uh, native seeds available, wildflower seeds, different mixes for different locales, uh, and those are becoming more and more available at, at most garden centers and Sloat has those as well. And then you should get to know Larner's Seeds in uh, Bolinas, look at their website, L-A-R-N-E-R, -E uh, wonderful source of native the, California seeds. The fun thing about Larner is that she melds natives with edibles because she actually has worked with a lot of native edibles and used to have open house on Mother's Day where you could munch um, chia cookies and, and roasted bay nuts and stuff like that. So that was a gas. Um, let's see, I, I have one technical question here. Is it okay to use a Q-tip to self-pollinate my dwarf cherry? Well, I, I think Q-tips are used, although I think paint brushes are more commonly used. A very soft uh, paint brush will uh, be less likely to damage uh, when, when you place, you can get the pollen with the Q-tip. The problem will be being gentle enough to place the pollen with the Q-tip where a, a paintbrush sort of mimics the hairs on a, a pollinating insect. That would be my suggestion. Yeah, this, yeah, the stigma is ready to receive and you don't want to smash it because it has to create that pollen tube down to the uh, down to the ovum. Uh, let's see, and uh, uh, any suggestions for edibles for the fog belt? Well, sure. Um, all of the uh, broccolis and cabbages and kales and lettuces. Uh, and arugula. Greens, and arugula, every leafy green is and, delighted to live in the fog belt. And peas. Uh, and peas as well. And artichokes. Uh, and artichokes are grown commercially in the fog belt, right? Strawberries, for that matter, uh, believe it or not. Um, the difficulty without a lot of sun is maturing uh, large fruits that have to, where the plant has to make a lot of sugars to make them sweet. Uh, so if you're going to grow tomatoes in the fog belt, grow small tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> If you're going to grow tomatoes, grow early tomatoes and the same with peppers. Um, and don't try to grow a, a, a better boy tomato in the fog belt. Uh, let's see, we got any others here? Uh, miner's lettuce in the fog belt? Well, sure, uh, it'll grow fine. It has a very short growing season, so you have to stay on top of it. Uh, and you can collect seeds from that, a few of them and uh, make sure that you have another uh, crop the next year. Yeah, I had a huge flush of miner's lettuce in February, but you're right, it's, it's edible for two weeks. And then, but that's sort of the, the French way, right? If something is in season, you enjoy it for those one or two weeks and you wait 50 weeks until you get it again. You don't eat raspberries in the, in the winter time. You that's have right. them when they're perfect. I don't even bring raspberries in the house. I just eat them out in the garden because they're better right off the bush than they are walking 50 feet into the house. Let's see, Margaret asks, do raspberries grow in dry areas? And if so, do they spread? They like water and they spread. Well, they, yeah, but in a dry area, um, they're not going to spread. Um, uh, for instance, uh, I, I have some horrible patch of Himalayan blackberries. Um, but as we've gotten drier and drier, the patch has gotten smaller and smaller. I don't irrigate it. I leave it there for the animals to live in um, because it protects them a little bit. Um, but I've noticed that the patch has gotten smaller and smaller, and I'm sure that would be true of raspberries too. Uh, as the soils get drier and drier with our, our drought, um, they are not gonna spread on their own unless they have some irrigation. 
Yeah. All right. Well, gosh, everybody, uh, this has been fun. Um, I hope you will all, uh, you know, look at the uh, video, look at the slides again, remind yourselves of the, the Keystone plants, uh, plant those uh, giant oak trees for future generations, um, and uh, take a look at the June 25th Create a Pollinar, Pollinator Habitat webinar at 10 a.m., and uh, otherwise get out there and tend your gardens and uh, enjoy the fruits of your labor and spend some time in the garden just watching the uh, pollinators do their job. It's really fascinating and you will start to notice that there aren't just European honeybees flying around but lots of other little critters um, that you may be able to start to identify. Uh, and uh, that becomes great fun. So thank you, Joan. Right, like being a birder, you can be a beer. You can be a beer, absolutely. Uh, all right, uh, okay. then we'll sign off for today. And uh, thank you all for attending and see you next time. Ciao.